This is the City Planning Commission public meeting held at Spectre Hall, 22 Reed Street. Today is Monday, no, I'm sorry, today is Wednesday, November 1st, 2017. As a courtesy during the proceedings, we ask that you please turn off all cell phones and beepers. All speakers should fill out a speaker's card. In addition, we ask that those providing testimony, please identify yourself, limit your remarks to three minutes, and speak clearly into the microphone. I will now call the roll. Chair Lago? Here. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Here. Commissioner Bessa? Commissioner Cerullo? Here. Commissioner De La Us? Here. Commissioner Dweck? Here. Commissioner Edie? Here. Commissioner Efron? Here. Commissioner Knight? Commissioner Levin? Here. Commissioner Marin? Here. Commissioner Ortiz? Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of Wednesday, October 18, 2017, and special meeting of Monday, October 30th, 2017. On the minutes, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The minutes are approved. Scheduling, on calendar numbers one through five, we have resolutions for adoption. Scheduling Wednesday, November 15, 2017, for a public hearing to be held in Spectre Hall, 22 Reed Street. On the resolution, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The resolutions are adopted. The next part of the calendar is the report section on page four. Borough of the Bronx, calendar number six, CD1, C170145, PCX. In the matter of an application for the site selection and acquisition of property concerning the Shelter and Arms Daycare Center. For a favorable report on calendar number six, Chair Lago. I'd like to make a few comments, um, and this is in addition to the comments and the robust discussion that we had at the review session. Um, I have to start out by thanking the Housing, Economic, and Infrastructure Planning Division um, at the Department of City Planning, but I also want to give a special a shout out to our EARD staff. This is a citywide amendment, and the environmental review was done entirely in-house, so special thanks to them. To put this in a slightly historic perspective, this process started two years ago with the announcement of the 10-point industrial action plan. Sure. Chair? Oh, yes. Sorry. We're still on the this first one. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had an outdated schedule. So. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, what I should say is Emily Latellis said, never mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. But it sounds like we're in for a treat. <laughs> <laughs> we are. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number six. Borough of Queens, calendar number seven, CD4, N180108, HKQ. In, in a matter of an, a communication concerning the landmark designation of the old St. James Episcopal Church, on the adoption of calendar number seven for referral to the city council. Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Us? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number seven. <clears throat> Borough of Staten Island, calendar number eight, CD three, N170423 RCR in the matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 6600 Highland Boulevard for adoption on calendar number eight. Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number eight. Citywide, calendar numbers nine and 10. Calendar number nine has been withdrawn. Calendar number 10, N170425AZRY. In the matter of a, an application for a zoning tax amendment concerning the self storage tax amendment. For a favorable report on calendar number 10. Okay. <coughs> Chair Lago. Finally, and with apologies for a little <laughs> bit of repetition, um, I do want to note the work, not just of housing, economic and infrastructure planning, but also the fact that this was an in-house environmental review on a citywide text amendment. Also, again, to put it in context, this started around two years ago with the announcement of the 10-point industrial action plan, which emphasizes the important roles of IBZs in employment growth. So with this proposal, um, 
we are reflecting the feedback, the information that we learned from industrial advocates and also from the self-storage industry. There were pushes and pulls in very different directions, and I think it was reflected in our robust discussions at the commission. So we believe that we are threading the needle, um, and the result is a balancing of very different equities. On the one hand, we are carrying through on the objective of ensuring that job-intensive industrial and manufacturing businesses can continue to operate and to find appropriate siting opportunities in our IBZs, which are our most active industrial areas. At the same time, we've sought to reduce the impacts on the self-storage industry, recognizing that self-storage is an amenity for many New York City residents and also businesses. Uh, we're particularly proud that in this proposal, we have found a mechanism for creating industrial space in connection with self-storage development. This is a model that doesn't exist elsewhere in the US. And so, uh, like with so many of our zoning and planning initiatives, we feel that we are leading the way. I also want to call out that in our report, in the consideration section of the report where the commission reflects on what the factors were, um, I want to call out a few sentences in particular that I think reflect the challenge that we face here. One is um, that we recognize that accessory office and retail uses, provided that they are truly accessory, are considered appropriate since many industrial companies successfully incorporate these accessory uses into their business models. I think we are seeing that increasingly as the nature of industrial activity is changing. The second consideration that I would like to read out is that the commission incorporates IBZs into the zoning resolution as designated areas in M districts to acknowledge these areas as the city's most important industrial areas where job intensive industrial businesses need to be provided with appropriate siting opportunities. The commission concurs with testimony regarding the importance of vigilant enforcement to ensure that the city's goals and objectives are met and considers that the enforcement of the proposed amendments to the zoning resolution as modified by the relevant city agencies, most notably the Department of Buildings, is key to the success of the proposal. The commission further calls upon the Department of Small Business Services, which contracts with a nonprofit organization servicing businesses and IBZs to work to assure that these organizations have the resources to support the objectives of this zoning text amendment. And on that basis, I vote yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. I agree with the objectives of the, of the amendment. I vote yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Let me begin as I did uh, on Monday during the review session by acknowledging the work of the staff on this proposal, their efforts and their follow up, uh, their insight and their willingness to hear me out has not gone unappreciated. And they taught me a lot as has all of those who testified on this application during the public hearing and as you all have as my colleagues with the thoughtful questions and the discussion during this process. And there's no question that I understand the underlying intent of the proposal, and I certainly support that as preserving industrial business zones for both traditional and emerging industrial uses should be an important land use policy goal in our city. And while I am convinced that conceptually this seems to accomplish that goal, I'm also convinced that, respectfully to all those who feel otherwise, that this is one of those perfect, the devil is in the details proposals. Any proposal that targets a particular business or industry, as this one does, requires our utmost certainty that we will accomplish what we are setting out to do. I am not sure we can be that certain. Concerns, I certainly cannot, and concerns <clears throat> about how and why we selected lot sizes we did, how we defined the large and small sites which trigger other requirements, the how and why we are mandating sizes of units and why that should even be a concern to us once we permit the use to exist, and the uncertainty of whether a financial hardship argument can be sustained at the Board of Standards and Appeals when the reality may be that market demand, proximity to work or home, or other factors may control what is needed more than the financial inability to make the business work. So despite my interest in wanting to preserve opportunities for IBZs, I cannot support this particular proposal's attempt to do it. And therefore, I vote no. Commissioner Delos. Um, over the last decade or more, 
Through land use actions or direct government action, New York City has lost millions of square feet dedicated to industrial manufacturing uses. Additionally, non-industrial uses such as self-storage hotels and entertainment businesses, which are currently allowed as of right in manufacturing areas, push up rents and push out industrial uses in area zone for manufacturing, <laughs> including industrial business zones or IBZs. This makes it harder for true industrial uses to survive and thrive in the city's industrial areas. Why should we care? We should care for many reasons, including because industrial and manufacturing areas in New York City are experiencing a resurgence, and with that comes good paying jobs with career ladders that are especially accessible to New Yorkers without advanced degrees. I happen to be married to a German. German manufacturing is well known worldwide in no small part because the German government supports manufacturing and workforce development on multiple levels. That support has created thousands of mid-size manufacturers that are known for their quality and precision. Manufacturing drives that country's economy. The German economy happens to be more equitable than the U.S. economy. When Mayor de Blasio announced his action plan to grow 21st century industrial manufacturing uh, jobs in New York City nearly two years ago, protections for core in industrial business areas, or IBZs, were central to that effort. The original text presented by DCP, which required a special permit for self-storage facilities and IBZs, I believe strikes the right balance and is good for New York City's industrial businesses, its economy, and its workforce. Under the original text, self-storage facilities would have still been built as of right in area zone manufacturing outside of IBZs. The ATEX has many flaws, as laid out by Commissioner Cerullo, and I ask the City Council to support the original intent of the original text and the original proposal. I would have voted yes on the original uh, text, but it's been withdrawn. And so I vote no on the A text. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Evie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? As many know, I have been concerned that uses other than manufacturing and accessory uses in IBZs designated by the city, including the location of storage by city agencies. The citywide text amendment to limit self-storage in IBZs is a commendable goal toward limiting non-industrial uses and increasing manufacturing and employment therein. In the best case, the special permit process will allow for limited self-storage and resu result in new additional manufacturing space. The designation of a zoning term of of designated manufacturing area districts is a step in the right direction towards making sure these IBZs are the thriving sanctuaries for diverse high employment manufacturing they were intended to be. I implore the city to make the necessary administrative and budgetary decisions to have adequate resources for the nonprofits and city agencies overseeing these IBZs to accomplish this goal and recognize that the report states this directly. While the text is acknowledged by our chair to be one of balance, and I would say compromise, I believe it is also a necessary step towards regulating the uses within the IBZs. I too thank the staff and chair for handling a very complicated and nuanced issue, and I vote yes. Commissioner Levin. Um, the chair has said that we're threading the needle um, for reasons articulated by my colleagues. Um, I hope we're not splitting the baby, um, mm -hmm. but I'll vote yes with misgivings. Okay, Commissioner Marin. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 10. The next part of the calendar is the public hearing section on page 7. Borough of the Bronx, calendar numbers 11, 12, and 13. Calendar number 11, CD1, C180031, ZMX. Calendar number 12, C180032, HAX. Calendar number 13, N180033, ZRX. A public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments and for a UDAP designation, project approval, and disposition of city-owned property concerning 425 Grand Concords. We are going to have a 10-minute presentation by the applicant team, which is comprised of Winifred Campbell, Christoph Stump, John Wolfing, Thomas Brown, and Ted Weinstein. Good, good morning, Chair Lago and Commissioners. My name is Winifred Campbell, representative for the applicant HPD. It is my pleasure to present to you a project which is a little different for the South Bronx and intentionally so. 
The project is 425 Grand Concourse, located on the northeast corner of East 144th Street and the Concourse. The project, as proposed, will provide 276 units of affordable rental housing for a diversity of income levels plus one super unit in a 27-story building. Being designed to bring the South Bronx into the 21st century, century architecturally, this building is somewhat taller than our usual development. But this is a standalone site on a major street near a major institution and mostly surrounded by non-residential uses. This transformative project is in sync with what started in the Mont Haven area triggered by the 2009 Lower Concourse rezoning. The proposed project was selected by, uh, as a result of a 2015 HPD RFP. In coordination with HPD and the development team, the Parks Department will be rebuilding and reopening the currently closed Garrison Playground, which adjoins the development site. So in a couple of years, the community will not only have 277 units of new affordable housing, they will also have a brand new park. The park and proposed development site are on the southern end of a long block which runs from East 149th Street to 144th Street. Too often, there's very little street activity on this block, especially after the adjacent Postos Community College closes or between semesters. This project with its residential, retail, and community facility uses is going to activate the street life on this er in this area year round. It is important to know that the area is well served by public transportation with three IRT train lines, as well as four bus lines, including an express bus to Manhattan. This development was designed to take advantage of the transit amenity. The actions before you are the approval of the disposition and UDAP designation, the approval of the zoning map amendment, and the approval of, a zoning, of zoning text amendments related to mandatory inclusionary housing. The community board approved the project and the Bronx Borough President has issued a very supportive report and recommendation. It has been said that the Bronx's Grand Concourse emulates Francis Champs-Élysées. This project is deserving of the Grand Concourse and the Grand Concourse is deserving of it. We request your approval of the actions of, to facilitate the 425 Grand Concourse project. Members of the development team are here to provide details about the project. Good morning. I'm Christoph Stump with Trinity Financial, one of the development partners. The other development partner is MBD Community Housing Corporation. Um, Ms. Campbell has uh, already uh, hinted to the surrounding uses, light industrial manufacturing. We have a large institutional as, uh, with hostos. Uh, we have a park directly adjacent and warehouses and uh, a very limited multifamily residential. The site is currently zone C44 and was left out in the 2009 lower concourse rezoning. The city now plans to align the zoning of the site with the southerly C6 district that was implemented in the lower concourse rezoning. The project, uh, the proposed project, uh, tr tries to um, activate this area with a host of uses that uh, play at different times during the day and during the weekend. 277 units with um, over 50% to be family units. Um, all units are priced uh, for applicants, affordably for applicants uh, having an income between 30% and 100% AMI. Uh, the entrance of the residential portion is on the Grand Concourse. Uh, on, also on Grand Concourse on East 144th Street and wrapping around to Walton Avenue is a 12,000 square foot retail space. Uh, there's also a loading berth uh, located on Walton Avenue. 
uh, uh, proposed project includes a 4,000 square foot family care center with an entrance on Grand Concourse, a 1,000 square foot cultural facility with the entrance on Grand Concourse, and a 36,000 square foot educational facility with an entrance on Walton Avenue. Garrison Park, directly adjacent to the north, it's a separate project, is part of the Community Parks Initiative and is being redesigned by Parks right now in coordination with our project. A walkway on Garrison Park on the southerly edge, directly adjacent to the proposed development, uh, will connect Walton Avenue and Grand Concourse, uh, approximately in line with East 146th Street. Artifacts from a building that stood there before, PS31, that the uh, city found noteworthy and, uh, and valuable to preserve are going to be uh, displayed along the walkway. Good morning, my name is John Wolfling from Datner Architects. I'm gonna speak about a part of the design that's uh, extremely exciting to me, uh, which is the Passive House uh, Initiative. Uh, for those of you that know a little bit about Passive House, uh, it's a complex system. I could go on for much more time than I actually have to describe the system, but I'll summarize it by saying it's a, an extremely low energy approach to uh, designing uh, sustainable buildings. Uh, it's actually particularly well suited to multifamily housing like this because of the density of the occupants. A lot of the uh, benefits are achieved through the heating that comes from the occupant load, the appliances, the lighting, uh, so the building retains all of that heat. It also has the indoor air quality component to it. We're going to be providing fresh air, uh, which I think in, from, uh, as many of you know, the Bronx has environmental conditions with, um, uh, with asthma and things like that. So this is going to directly address that sort of site-specific condition. Um, we also have a series of amenities for the residents. You can see on this, these floor plans here, there's a, uh, some community space that's directly adjacent to outdoor space that's at the podium, the base of the podium. We also have uh, a upper roof terrace that's gonna have fantastic views of the city. Um, that's up at the, uh, the top of the building. Uh, there was also a question in one of the earlier hearings about unit sizes. Um, the building is being planned very efficiently. Um, the uh, HPD design guidelines are gonna be adhered to. We are gonna be not on the small side, not on the high side, but kind of right in the middle. Uh, so we're, we're approaching that from a uh, kind of a, a a, uh, I don't know, a Goldilocks perspective. Um, we also um, oriented the tower uh, in, a, in a very deliberate way that is maybe not ideal for passive house. In passive house, you want to maximize your southern exposure, but what we did was we turned it so it faced, it's on the north-south axis, and that was primarily to uh, reduce the amount of shadows that would be cast upon the park of the North Garrison Playground. Um, and that is the quick summary of the project. So thank you. I'm Ted Weinstein. I'm director of Bronx Planning HPD. I just want to mention a couple of things about the RFP uh, that was issued. This was the result of an RFP. This was a site that was city-owned. Um, prior building, unfortunately, had to be demolished. Um, and that gave us, and like I always say, sometimes out of tragedy comes opportunity. And this became an opportunity to do something a little different at, at an important location. One of the things that I want to say specifically is there was a significant amount of consultation with the Department of City Planning prior to the issue of the RFP. And so we had, sometimes an RFP just offers the site um, and basically says, okay, this is what we want to build here. This has a number of design guidelines, things that we wanted to, to highlight and would give preference to in the selection process. 144th Street, you know, which some might just think is a side street, not important. It is going to be a major pathway leading toward the river. Um, and in fact, at the end of 144th, just two blocks west, is where the city through eminent domain is acquiring property to create a park. That was one of the things that came out of the 2009 rezoning of the lower concourse. And so uh, transparency, the current plan is to have um, fronting on, on the Grand Concourse but then wrapping around on 144, probably a supermarket. And again, that'll have a lot of glass, it'll create activity, there'll be visibility. So things like this came out of discussions that we had with the city planning staff, um, as well as uh, the, you know seeing what the proposals themselves would uh, had when they were submitted. So, um, and, and again, just, 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 just as a final thing before we start taking questions, uh, that uh, we just think this is a really a transformative project 
Um, it's something that it's reported like a standalone site. It's not surrounded by residential buildings. It's not in the middle of a block someplace. Um, it's going to really stand out. And it's going to be something that's going to really activate this block uh, much more so than it is now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> questions from the commission? Commissioner Delos. We'll all be happy to take questions. Yeah, of course. With um, I'd love a little bit of background about the relationship between MBD and Trinity Financial and, and how that's going to work out um, as the project moves forward. Okay. I'll speak to that. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, my name is Thomas Brown. I'm uh, Vice President of uh, Development with Trinity Financial. Uh, to answer your question, Commissioner, uh, we went into the RFP uh, in a partnership with uh, MBD Community Housing Corporation. and. Uh, the way we operate uh, with our partnership is to be fully collaborative uh, with uh, MBD. So MBD is fully immersed in our decision-making process uh, going forward, and, uh, both on the design and financing of the project. So, so, that, so it's an equal partnership right. between a nonprofit and a for-profit? Yes, yes. Okay. absolutely. Right. Other questions? Mr. Commissioner Marim. Um, Thank you for the presentation. And my questions are going to be more towards not the residential portion because we know that that's funding and subsidized through, through, through HPD's affordable housing program. Mine is more about the base and the, the, the uses in the base mm -hmm. and funding for the base itself. So I heard originally family care, cultural facility, educational facility, and Ted Weinstein mentioned the supermarket. So can we elaborate on those and how funding will take place for those? <laughs> Uh, well, in the non-residential component of the building, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we have a clinic, which will be a tenant, rental tenant. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, retail. Uh, we haven't identified an operator for that space yet, but we're looking at that as a, as a rental relationship as well. Uh, we're, for the educational component, we're looking at uh, charter school. We originally went in uh, on our RFP with an operator, uh, and... Uh, since that time, uh, the operator has had a change of leadership, and we're, now we're actually looking uh, for new operators for that space. And the clinic, you have a, a user already? Uh, right? Yes, we have an operator. Yeah. And what about the mention of supermarket? Is that is that something that you're endeavoring to do? Is that something that's planned and will happen? Uh, we're endeavoring to do that. We're, we're looking at operators right now. We're speaking to a number of uh, both supermarket operators and other commercial operators. So would that take space away from any of the other uses that you've planned already, no. or is that, is that space already planned? No, self-contained space. Thank you. Other questions? Vice Chair Knuckles. Well, what's the B plan uh, if the charter school doesn't work out? Well, we kept it as a, we looked at it as a community space, so it's been designed, and maybe our design team can speak to that. It's a community facility. How, bi how big is it in square footage? Uh, 36,000 square feet. A lot of space. Yes, yes. But uh, to your question, we are endeavoring to uh, to identify an operator. And uh, right now, the B plan, well, we're going through a complete list of uh, charter school operators right now, and in addition to other educational and other community facility operators. Can't be more specific now, but it's a work in progress. Commissioner Levin? Sorry to come back to oh. Levin. No, you were up next, and then we'll come back to Levin. Um, yeah, I, I have a question about the um, zoning that's being planned here, and I think it's a question that predates the selection of this developer and goes to the um, uh, rules of the game that were laid out in the RFP. Um, as I understand it, it was the RFP that identified this zoning as being appropriate for the site, and um, testimony has indicated that was in consultation with the Department of City Planning. Um, it does call for a density that's about 40% bigger than the zoning that was laid out in the lower concourse for the stretch immediately adjacent to the south. Um, and while I acknowledge that this is um, a, just a, tr a spectacularly designed building and it's accomplishing um, a tremendous amount um, architecturally on its own terms. Um, I think we have to be careful about the neighborhood into which it's being inserted. And Ms. Campbell indicated that this, si this zoning is intended to be in sync with the lower concourse rezoning, but I think it's quite a significant departure. 
And so um, I guess I'm curious to know about the thought process that went into <coughs> the 2015 decision to specify this, this zoning. It kind of removes the commission from much of a consideration about what zoning is appropriate here. Um, and I'd like to uh, know a little bit more about how that came about. And 2009 was not that far in the past when we got to 2015. So um, there was a pretty quick turnaround about, uh, you know, change of heart about what zoning would be appropriate at that corner. Okay. Um, I think a lot has happened since 2009, and certainly in terms of the approach um, of the city and the various agencies, um, you know, the, the need for affordable housing. Um, and I mean, I don't want to stand here and say that if, if in 2009 had it to be done over again, that it would be different. But, you know, that as time goes on, I mean, sometimes uh, rezonings are done, and then some years later, there's a thought that maybe part of it can be a little different. Again, because things change. Um, I think it's probably the site, um, you know, just the block down. That's a long block from 144th, the corner, which this is, to 149th, which is a major intersection, is one long block on that side of the street. Um, and Hostos is right across the street and next to it. The park is there. Um, there's just a lot that goes on in that immediate area. And so I think the feeling was, and this was done, again, in consultation with city planning staff, um, you know, we, we, we never, at least I never, um, try to push a, a rezoning without consultation with city planning staff. Um, we just thought this was just a great site to maybe do something a little bit different. And, and not that different, really. Um, there are other buildings coming up in the area, um, a couple of blocks to the west, and then, of course, on the waterfront, which is just another couple of blocks after that, um, you know, will there be some uh, significant size buildings as well? Um, I, I think if it was right next to, let's say, if it was in the middle of a block of six-story or five-story buildings, or even more so small homes, maybe there would be a different thought. But um, we just thought that it was a, a, a unique site and, and an opportunity to do something, like we said, a little different. If I might just make an observation to make sure that the record is clear, which is that this particular site wasn't included in the 2009 rezoning because uh, department staff felt at the time that this was a unique site that would need its own special planning treatment. Commissioner Marin. Commissioner Efron. Thank you. There have been several references made to Hostos, and it does feel like it's an integral part of um, the potential of this development site. Uh, is there somebody who can speak to whether or not that is fully built, and if there are any other plans with regard to the Hostos site? Um, Hostos will certainly tell you they're not fully built. Um, they would like to be able to build more. There's actually behind this, on across Walton, there is a building that is... Um, uh, it's a uh, city university building, and Hostos will be transforming that into a facility that they'll use. Um, Hostos, <coughs> I, I don't want to speak for the city university, but Hostos would like to have more space. The development team spoke to Hostos about whether they might have been interested in using the educational space within this building, um, and they've not been able to uh, give it an affirmative answer to that. Um, but... Um, uh, you know, Hostos would certainly like to have more space. If, if that were, I'm not that answers the question. Yeah. It, it is. Um, <clears throat> I suppose we will or we won't hear from Hostos <laughs> as the record remains open. Commissioner <laughs> Delos. I'm just wondering if somebody can um, go through the, the unit mix and the AMI breakdown for the project. <coughs> I will. So on the affordability, as mentioned in the presentation, uh, there's a sp AMI spread between 30% AMI and 100% AMI. So I'll give you the percentages by AMI band. 10% uh, mm -hmm. at 30% AMI, 10% at 40% AMI, 30% mm -hmm. at 60% AMI, 25% mm -hmm. uh, at 80% AMI, and another 25% at 100%. And the unit breakdown? Oh, and the Thank unit you. breakdown, uh, okay. total 277 units, mm -hmm. 45 studios, 92 one bedrooms, mm -hmm. 94 two bedrooms, and uh, 46 three bedrooms. 
If I may, in, in the conversation that you had with the community board, did the issue of the the mix, uh, or the depth of affordability, did that come up? I, I saw the note specific to the size of the units, which I know is a concern citywide now that people are seeing the new HPD design guidelines on paper. Um, but I'm just wondering if the, if the depth of affordability came up, especially given the community's area need and income. Uh, it's come up throughout our outreach process, both with the community board and and also outreach to local elected officials and other stakeholders mm -hmm. in the area. What we found is that uh, this is an up-and-coming up uh, borough and more specifically an upcoming area. And, and uh, what we've heard is that there is a need for both low-income low housing and units as well as units for professionals and uh, higher income, middle income. Mm -hmm. Let me just add, um, one of the things that I, I, I pretty regularly attend community board uh, housing land use committee meetings in the South Bronx, and one of the things that we hear constantly is, um, depending on which month you're there, um, you're, there are definitely times that you know we're told, you know, our people can't afford, you know, there should be more very low. Mm -hmm. and then you can go back to that same committee the following month, and they say, what are you doing for our young professionals making seventy thousand? And both arguments are correct, mm -hmm. um, and which is why one of the reasons why we like to do. A project that has a range. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, for many years, everything that was done in the South Bronx was low income. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe it wasn't 30 percent, but it was certainly no more than 60. Mm -hmm. um, and now we've gotten to the point where there is a market. Um, there are those young professionals. Um, in this particular case, the borough president and the city councilman both strongly support that. The borough president, in fact, in his report, which just arrived this week, you know, has a I think a very well written comment on on that on the importance of having the range. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's something that we think this is a project that meets those both those needs. Mm -hmm. it, if I may, one more last follow-up, and I promise I'm last one. I'm, I'm just wondering, and maybe you have experience with this, um, in, in marketing affordable units at 100% of AMI in the area, if there are going to be special considerations made in marketing um, to ensure that you're able to fill those units, if there's any, any concern about that? Well, as part of our development process, we've undertaken uh, market research uh, mm -hmm. on the area. And uh, what we're finding in the consultation is that our, our targeted 100% AMI units are below the comparable uh, rents in the area. And we're putting a top of the, the market quality Mm -hmm. uh, eat product on the on the market, so mm -hmm. a, as well as the development that's taking place in the area as well. So we're we're confident that we can rent up the uh, units. Okay. And then and, and I don't mean to you know, um, monopolize. But, um, one of the things about this project that was that we picked it uh, through the evaluation process, competitive process was that it offered a lot of things, obviously transportation, mm -hmm. you know, it's right there near the buses and trains, and for those who, you know, have cars, you know, the highways, um, shopping. Um, one of the things also, which I don't think anybody's mentioned, is they're gonna have a small laundry room on each floor, um, rather than just one, that, that sold me right away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, There's a 5% so, set aside for city employees. And so there, <laughs> You know, it, it's it's very often, and, and this has this a lot of nice features. You know, it's amenities, 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 um, mm -hmm. and I think they've made an effort here to do that to be able to attract um, people of those income levels. Vice Chair Nichols. Thank you. Uh, I think this was mentioned uh, on Monday, but I just wanted to uh, hear a little more about it. Uh, the first condition cited by the community board was uh, to retain a new development property manager. So, without naming names. Could you just explain what the dynamics were uh, and why that came to the board's attention? Does anybody know? Well, at the time of, uh, at the time of, su of uh, submitting our RFP, yeah. we had a management agent uh, that we've worked with in the past uh, that's worked on other projects throughout the city. And uh, we brought them onto our team. And we were uh, fortunate to be uh, selected. In going through our process, uh, we took in feedback from the community, and, I th and the management agent had a, in their history a few uh, uh, incidents with, uh, within the community. And uh, that was still being resolved. But again, in, in order to address 
the community's uh, concerns, we went to another, where we removed that managing agent and we're in a process of replacing it. Thank you. Commissioner. Hi. Um, uh, two sets of questions. One, um, with respect to sort of the orientation of the ground floor uses and the decision uh, made there, um, there are a few sort of questions intertwined. One, uh, Commissioner Knuckles mentioned sort of the, and it's been mentioned before that, you know, the takers for the, for the space. You know, you, you do not, it doesn't seem that you have someone lined up for the cultural space. That's a challenging kind of use to fill, and it's important that, you know, we have a good operator and, and we're not yes. able to uh, weigh, weigh in on that. Um, and, you know, absent, absent a use or an activity at that corner, um, you have retail on the southern part of the uh, site. Um, but uh, I'm sort of curious where you think much of the pedestrian traffic is coming from. And, and you know, we always have concerns, because this has happened, that these spaces lie vacant for a while while you figure something out. And we have a lot of hosto students. Um, we have, a, you know, a, the stop, the train stop, which is, you know, busy stop. Um, and the retail sort of at a distance with what might be a uh, vacant space for some time. And so why were those decisions made? And, and um, you know, what happens if you don't find an operator? Do you have flexibility uh, with that space to fill it with uh, more active uses? Well, the space, as Ted mentioned, uh, along the 144th Street uh, corridor, Eventually, is envisioned being uh, uh, connected to the uh, to the Hall of River Water, so that mm. went to somewhat into our decision making process, actually, and also keeping a, a corner space along Grand Concourse as well. You know, uh, with the community, with the cultural facility, we feel that that is very important. That's why we're we're going through a very careful selection process and working with the borough president's office and other stakeholder in here to identify just the right space. You know, as I mentioned earlier uh, to the commission, it's still a work in progress, but we're looking to identify tenants for that space. So you, you've been in conversations with organizations oh, that absolutely. might, okay. Yeah. Um, and then a separate, separate line of inquiry. Um, you mentioned that you're waiving out of the parking requirements, and then the community board has mentioned um, that uh, one of their conditions was to expand parking opportunities at the project frontage along Grand Concourse. Um, could you speak to sort of the, those are two incongruent, you know, mm. messages that community board seems to want parking, or what's, what's the backstory around that? Um, the, the community board would like to see there be some kind of parking provided. Um, one of the things that was talked about was um, on the concourse itself, um, maybe having, and, and, and before I say this, we didn't agree that this was a good idea, but the, the idea came up of having angle parking there, because that increases spaces. It, it would just not be a safe place to do that. Um, so what, I think the purpose of that condition that they put in really was a more general, you know, like if there's some way of finding some type of parking um, rather than specific. Um, they, they, they seem to understand that on-site parking uh, there's a lot of rock on this site. It, it's just not physically feasible and financially feasible. Um, but they and, and the development team would be happy as well if there was some off-site parking arrangement made. We have been, HPD um, has been in communication with DOT about looking at the area to see if maybe there is some idea of how something can be done. So it's something that, that we're all looking into. And, and you know, But the community board, you know, they, they would like something to be done if possible. It's, it's, we just don't know anything is possible. Thank you. Other questions from the commission? Yes, Commissioner Levy. Could I ask about the design of the school space? Um, was it even conceivable that the school construction authority would have been interested in this space? <laughs> um, and it seems you're headed in a different direction. Is it designed in a way that it could become public school space? Is it? I mean, just because we see a lot of public school designs here, is this that kind of space as it's been laid out? So the space was designed uh, in cooperation with a possible charter school tenant. Mm -hmm. And uh, so charter schools uh, have different design requirements as um, 
public schools. And uh, public schools probably um, have some limitations um, that, that we can't fit with this uh, design and it uh, would certainly take away from the affordable housing if we were trying to make this fit. Okay. I, I see HPD nodding. Um, so <laughs> as you put out the RFP, was, was, was including a public school a consideration here? Or? Um, not in the RFP, but subsequent when their original charter school operator had to withdraw, I personally spoke to the school construction authority about just what the actual guidelines were, what were the requirements, and then asked some calculations to be done what that would mean. Um, it, it would have meant losing about 50 affordable housing units to then change the space to um, SCA DOE space. And we just thought that wasn't uh, something that could be done. Okay. Are there other school, um, uh, what is the state of school need in this um, area and what plans, I realize the HPD doesn't do schools, but you know the neighborhood pretty well. Uh, what other plans are there for schools? The SCA schools the actually area? is budgeted for a school in this subdistrict, um, and uh, they, they need to find a site. They don't have a site. Um, Right. Um, I will say, though, within the largest school district, a different subdistrict in the same district, um, it was just announced recently that they're going to be building another school um, in the, this is Community School District 7. They'll be School District 7 because there is a lot of new housing coming in. They will be getting a new, um, a new school, um, just not in this subject, a few blocks north of here. Mm. Commissioner Keller, yeah. To that point, uh, was, was consideration given to whether or not SCA could use it for pre-K space as opposed to a full, full school? So um, pre-K um, space has some restrictions also, specifically with regards to um, separation from the ground floor. Yeah. This space was designed to be on the ground floor for a smaller portion and then mainly on the second and third floor. Mm -hmm. So pre-K okay. would be difficult. Okay. Other questions from the commission? These are the only speakers who have <laughs> signed up to speak on this matter, but I'll ask now if there is anyone else present who would want to speak. If not, I'll thank the applicant team, and the public hearing is closed. Thank you. Okay. Calendar numbers 14 through 18, these items have been laid over. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar number 19, CD1, C170024, ZMK, a public hearing in the matter of an application for a zoning map amendment concerning 116 Bedford Avenue rezoning. We have signed up to speak on this. Um, Frank St. Jacques, and with him available for questions is David Mannheimer. Good morning, Chair Lago, uh, Commissioners. My name is Frank Sajak. I'm with Sheldon Lobel, PC. Uh, we represent the applicant in this request for a zoning map amendment, which would add a C14 commercial overlay to the existing R6A district on the western block front of Bedford Avenue between North 10th and North 11th Street and the north side section of Williamsburg within Community District 1. You can see on the zoning change map to the left, uh, our project is situated between North 10th and North 11th on the west side of Bedford Avenue. The proposed C14 overlay would extend to a depth of 100 feet to include eight four-story buildings fronting Bedford Avenue and a garage which fronts North 10th Avenue, or excuse me, North 10th Street uh, to the south. The proposed rezoning would allow the applicant, who is the owner of 116 Bedford Avenue, to convert the ground floor uh, to commercial use. The proposed rezoning would also bring existing commercial uses on the block, block front into conformance with the use provisions of the zoning resolution. The proposed C14 commercial overlay reflects the current predominantly mixed use character of the western block front of Bedford Avenue between North 10th and North 11th streets where the C14 overlay is proposed to be mapped. The ground floor spaces of five of the eight buildings fronting this portion of Bedford Avenue are currently configured for commercial use. 
two of these five buildings on, uh, are occupied by active, legal, non-conforming ground floor commercial uses, including uh, the, the northernmost building, 110 Bedford Avenue, which is occupied by the Bedford Restaurant, and the southernmost building uh, at the corner of North 10th Street, which is occupied by All's Well Restaurant and the Little Axe Salon. There are three other buildings which have vacant ground floor commercial uses, uh, vacant ground floor commercial space, uh, which could be re reactivated to new use group six with new use, new use group six commercial tenants. Two of the eight buildings on the block front are entirely residential, including 112 Bedford Avenue, uh, the second building from the north uh, of the rezoning area, and 114 Bedford Avenue, which is adjacent to the proposed project site uh, at 116 Bedford Avenue. We'll note that there's more commercial use than residential use on the ground floor of the buildings along the block front. The two residential buildings occupy 50 feet of frontage, or about 25%, on Bedford Avenue in comparison to 125 feet, 62%, which is occupied by the five buildings that are configured for ground floor commercial use. Note that historically, commercial use has been permitted in the proposed rezoning area for the past, uh, for about 44 years, uh, prior to 2005, when the Greenpoint Williamsburg rezoning established the current R6A zoning. <laughs> An appropriate Happy to pause. answer any questions. <laughs> any questions for Mr. St. Jock or for Mr. Mannheimer? Commissioner Levin. Um, let's see. Um, I'm curious to know if this owner, I mean, obviously we're, we're um, you know, we see that the community board does not look very favorably on this application at all. Um, I think I understand the dilemmas of um, having a residential <coughs> population facing up against um, commercial spaces that can sometimes be pretty active and um, ha uh, have quality of life um, issues associated with them. Does this um, building owner own any other commercial properties in the neighborhood? Do they have a track record in this neighborhood for operating these kinds of places? They, they do not. They own two other buildings in the area that are, that are currently being converted uh, with, with ground floor commercial use, but they, they as of right, uh, but they do not have tenants for those spaces yet. So they're, they're not on the market yet. Um, so they, we can't you know, establish that they've, they've got a track record. Um, I'll note that they do, uh, they, the, the, the units, uh, the rental units, uh, residential rental units in the building above um, are, will, uh, will be rented out their market rate. Uh, so that the owner is really seeking to find a commercial tenant that's gonna be harmonious with those users. It's in their best interest, as well as in the interest of the community that they find a commercial tenant that, that um, is not gonna create quality of life issues. Okay, is the space being built out for a restaurant or um, bar type use? Well, or it's it's mechanically. It's currently. Uh, it was previously uh, a, a fully residential building. There's a, a currently a, a conversion underway, uh, a ground floor enlargement um, to create a, a full footprint on the ground floor. Um, the, there's an as of right conversion to a, uh, for a community facility space, uh, but it would be delivered to a tenant raw. So it's it's essentially just a a full footprint. Uh, raw commercial space. So there's, there's not a specific intention for a specific type of commercial use. Since you mentioned that the um, owner would like to have uh, a ground floor tenant that's harmonious with its market rate spaces up above, um, has, has there been any willingness on the part of the owner to actually restrict the use to uh, non-club, non-restaurant, non-eating and drinking establishments? There's, there's been internal discussion, but we haven't made any commitments relating to restricting that use. I, I think they're, they're, um, they're, they're conscious that they want to have a, a good tenant in place, um, but, but haven't yet made that commitment to, um, to, to restrict the, the use, you know, given, given the market. And um, so the, the answer is no, they, they haven't made that commitment. Can you share what you mean by given the market? Um, there's... Uh, the, the owner and, and applicant here um, just wants to, to to have the ability to, to find uh, to, to find to, to not limit their, their choice of potential tenants here. Uh, I think a blanket 
uh, limitation on on certain types of uses would, would certainly um, shrink their uh, their their options as, as far as a commercial tenant, um, and that's something that we've discussed internally. We just haven't made that that commitment yet. Um, and my uh, reference to the market was that, um, as as we've seen in the headlines, certainly there's um, there's uh, difficulty with uh, with retail currently uh, throughout the city. Uh, there are um, you know, some vacancies along Bedford, um, but we, we believe that that's just a, 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 a reflection of the current market and would, would be able to find a, a tenant, um, but just don't want to limit uh, the type of commercial tenant. Okay. Commissioner General Lewis. Uh, I'm just noticing in, in, in response to the community board's concerns, um, uh, your client indicated that uh, they would require the commercial tenant to consult a, sa uh, a sound engineer and install sound attenuation materials. I'm just wondering if in the negotiation with the potential tenant, that tenant isn't, if that becomes something that the owner, is the owner willing to do that if the tenant doesn't? I, I think so, and I can I can confirm that with, with the commission. Um, this was a, a commitment that was made to the borough president mm -hmm. um, and articulated as well to the commission. So. I, I, I don't see an issue with that. Okay, thanks. Other questions from the commission? Yes, Commissioner Levin. Well, not so much a question as an observation. Um, you know, there are several other neighborhoods um, where these kinds of applications are um, uniquely problematic, and um, particularly in Greenwich Village, um, we often see that the path to a successful um, result in a request for ground floor commercial includes um, a commitment that it will not be used for an eating and drinking establishment. Um, those come to us in a some, somewhat different um, uh, land use guise. There are often special permits in um, landmark areas, but it's the same issue from the community's um, standpoint, and we very often um, see a property owner making that commitment um, in order to get the ground floor commercial that they seek. Understood. We'll, we'll continue the discussion internally and report back to the commission. Commissioner, please. Uh, if I could speak to the other side of that issue, um, you know, I think we have mentioned that there's a softening in the retail market right now, um, particularly among soft goods, um, and that the growth and the strength in the market is in uh, food mm -hmm. uh, experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so, one of the things I think we've learned, because we also don't want vacancies. Um, although this is a very hot market, so maybe <laughs> um, it's less relevant to Williamsburg, but that um, offering flexibility with uh, rules of engagement is something that might be might make more sense when we're not quite sure what the trends are, you know, in the in the retail environment. So you know, making sure the operator is a good operator as opposed to preventing the use entirely. Certainly true. This is the the sensitivity here is. Um, heightened by the fact that there's no commercial across the street and the people who will, the residents who will be mostly affected by activity at this location will be the ones on the other side of the street. So I, all to be balanced. If I may, I would just note there, there are a number of blocks um, that, that share a similar uh, dimension to the, to, to the block here um, where the, the opposite side of the street is, is um, consists of brownstones with stoops and walk-ups that are not configured for, for commercial use in the same way. We, we have uh, received letters of support from uh, five of the, uh, in, including uh, the applicant, uh, five of the eight building owners on, on the block, uh, and all the business owners as expected. Uh, so we anticipate that um, this, this and, and two of the building owners across the street on, on that block uh, facing the, the project, uh, the rezoning here. Acknowledged. Other questions, comments from commissioners? I, um, if I had a crystal ball, I would see lots of trips by commissioners to this stretch of Bedford Avenue and um, a very at lively discussion <laughs> at the post-hearing follow-up. Um, we now have a speaker in opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we now have a speaker in opposition, John McDonald. Hi. Um, I live on one, at 112 Bedford Avenue. Um, two houses down from 116. Um, I just wanted to uh, speak about the problems that currently exist with the businesses that are already there. Um, 
First, I, I've lived there for about 15 years. My family's lived there since 1960. I've grown up being there, and I've seen the changes that have happened in Williamsburg. Um, with gentrification, there have been many positive things, and, and I feel like there's been a tipping point to where it's more imbalanced. In the beginning, there was a much more cohesive relationship between the businesses and the residents. Um, and now it seems to be more um, heavy on, on the businesses, and um, the residents are left kind of um, fighting for their, their peace and their quality of life issues. Um, and this is kind of continuous. Uh, rezoning of this block will make those challenges greater. Um, currently, there are three operating businesses on the block, all eating and drinking establishments. Um, there's noise issues with people, with uh, the exhaust vents, things like that. There are continuous problems that we, we deal with. Um, giving the commercial um, zoning will enable more of that. Um, and it's just something that's uh, left in, as an onus on us to kind of continually fight. It's already challenging as it is. Um, so the, um, the building as it is now, 116, I know you talked about um, maybe a commitment as to not being eating and drinking establishment, but it's rezoning the whole block then gives them, the, the other owners, the opportunity. So you don't have a commitment from, from everybody. Um, currently, there's, there's five buildings configured as storefronts, um, four of which are zoned commercial, and four of what, there are four on the block, commercial and four residential. So one building that's currently uh, a storefront is zoned residential, even though it's a storefront. Um, and one that is zoned commercial, for as long as I've seen it, which is 47 years, um, it's been apartments. And just several months ago, it was changed to a storefront. So um, even though it's, it's zoned. So it's, you know, the way it's presented, it seems like it's very much a commercial block as it is. But it's very much residential. It's not. Um, it's not as it as it seems. You know, it's uh, a block of, of wood framed houses built in the 1800s. Um, it's not something that's uh, very amenable to uh, the night life um, that's that's kind of become so popular in Williamsburg. Um, Thank you for okay. taking the time to come here and give a resident's perspective, Mr. McDonald. If you wouldn't mind waiting if there are questions sure. from the commission. Thank you. Commissioner Efron. I also want to thank you for coming. If you have anything in writing that you can share with us um, about uh, the current state, even as of a few weeks ago, it sounds like, with regard to um, the residential building, <coughs> the ground floor apartment that has since um, changed over, that would be very helpful. I think some of us will go out there, but it'd be helpful to have um, anything sure. you have as a guide. I mean, even if you go on to um, Google Maps, you can see that the building at 122 Bedford was apartments, and it wasn't a commercial space. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Ortiz. Um, you know, you spoke to some of the challenges uh, with some of the current users, um, and we've also discussed here perhaps some um, rules of engagement for uh, users. Are, is there, are there any um, requests or any insight you have in, in what kinds of, um, you know, conditions might uh, make this kind of use amenable, or is there just no, no compromise here? No, I mean, I think that, um you know, as it's currently being developed, they said it could be used as a, as a community resource. You know, something like that seems um, much more um, in needed as far as a balance. You know, there's, there's very few um, community spaces along Bedford Avenue. It's all eating and drinking establishments with some <coughs> markets here and there um, and some boutiques. Um, but there's like one doctor's office along the whole strat from the south side all the way to Greenpoint. Um, that's, that's lacking. So I feel like that is something that would be a, a fine usage of the space. Um, as far as the commercial usage of, of the spaces, um, backyard use would be a big issue. You know, right, right now, the, the, we live on Bedford Avenue. There's a ton of traffic, foot traffic, um, noise. And the, back, 
the backyards are um, a quiet space. And so if there's commercial usage, now at 116, they're, they're building out across the backyard, so it's not an issue for them. But allowing it for the other buildings then enables them to, be, to use their backyards um, for restaurant space, and then we're, we're hit front and back with those. So, so that would be the explanation. Yeah, that's very helpful, because that's the first time we've heard that particular concern. Um, and I, I would agree, you know, that, that the rear yard, uh, you know, activity at night is a, is a, a concern and an issue. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Commissioner Marie. Thank you for coming. I'm, I'm trying to under, better understand because you are listed as opposed, but it sounds like you would not be opposed if there was a use that was missing in the community. So is your objection based on what's currently there, or is your objection based on... I'm trying to figure out what the objection is here. Right. I would, I would prefer no more commercial use than already is there, but from what they're, they're saying, they can use the space as a... As a a um, community resource with doctors' offices, so or nonprofit office, you know, which is not residential, but seems like it would be um, more useful for the community in that regard. If, if it I has might to be just, one not residential, but that makes more sense to me. If I might clarify, the Sorry. current zoning currently allows a community facility use, like a doctor's office, um, but not commercial uses, and so I think that's the distinction. Yes. Other questions or comments from the commissioners? Thanks for coming. Then again, thank you, thank you for coming, Mr. McDonald. Thank you. These are the only speakers that we have signed up on this matter, but if there is anyone present who would like to be heard, please raise your hand. Then the public hearing on this matter is closed. <coughs> Borough of Brooklyn, calendar numbers 20 and 21. Calendar number 20, CD8, C170356, ZMK. Calendar number 21, N170357, ZRK. A public hearing in the matter of applications for a zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 587 Bergen Street rezoning. Our first speaker in support is Josh Reinsmith. Chair Lago and Commissioners. My name is Josh Reinsmith from the firm of Ackerman LLP, um, appearing on behalf of the applicant um, as its land use counsel. Um, this is an application um, seeking a zoning uh, map amendment to extend an existing R6B zoning district um, to cover the development site as well as a zoning text amendment um, to designate the site as a um, MIH area under option two. Um, the site is located on the north side of Bergen Street, approximately 210 feet east of the intersection with Carlton Avenue um, in the Prospect Heights neighborhood of Community District 8 in Brooklyn. Um, the site is currently zoned M11. Uh, however, it is immediately adjacent to an existing um, R6B zoning district to the, the west. Um, the site has been unimproved for over 60 years um, and is currently um, used uh, for parking um, by the owner of the property. Um, the proposed action uh, seeks to extend the adjacent R6B zoning district um, and it will facilitate the development of a new uh, residential building um, at the development site that will have 26 dwelling units, 10 of which are, will be permanently affordable under um, the mandatory inclusionary housing program. Um, the action will also um, uh, extend the R6B um, to a depth of 150 feet from Carlton Avenue uh, at Dean Street and will uh, bring three uh, existing townhomes that are non-conforming into conformance. Um, the community board, uh, community board eight, uh, voted overwhelmingly in favor of the application by a vote of 37 to two, um, with some conditions regarding um, notifying area residents as well as the community board um, about construction commencement and providing 24-hour hotline 
um, to reach the developer in the event that there are any construction related issues. Um, in addition, the community board um, asked that we make a good faith effort to set back uh, dormers on the first, uh, I'm sorry, fourth floor from the street line or, or the street wall. Um, in response, uh, before the full board vote, um, the applicant's architect um, redesigned the building to eliminate the dormers. Um, and this was all done in response to concerns about the community um, and maintaining um, the existing character of uh, the Prospect Heights Historic District, um, which is located immediately to the west. So the intent of the design was to maintain that street wall um, and then have the building set back. Uh, the community board asked for us to set back our dormers 10 feet. Um, instead, we were able to, to eliminate the dormers altogether. Um, so uh, we would have a street wall that um, mirrors uh, or is continuous with the um, uh, townhomes in the Prospect Heights Historic District and then set back uh, above that base height um, the full 15 foot that would be required for a narrow street. Questions for Mr. Weinsmith? Yes, Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. Um, I note that um, 10 of the 26 units will be under MIH. Mm -hmm. um, so that leaves 16 market rate Correct. units, um, 13 enclosed parking spaces. Correct. Um, so nearly a one to one parking ratio for your market rate units. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how will those uh, spaces be distributed? Will they only be offered or will they be offered equally? They will, or? They will be offered equally to all residents of the building. Okay, regardless of, of the status of their unit. Exactly, yes. Okay, and and I guess what's the development rationale for uh, the parking ratio as such? Uh, the, the amount of spaces were all that we could fit within the uh, cellar level using self-parking. Um, so zoning requires us to provide eight parking spaces. Um, however, we're providing 13 in the hope that uh, more of the building uh, tenants will utilize them. Um, but in terms of the exact number, it's just a function of what could be uh, configured in the cellar level. I guess because we deal with this often, and it's a very part, uh, it's a very um, transit rich community. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and there's a balance in this desire to uh, accommodate car ownership and not necessarily encourage it. And if from your perspective, it's necessary um, to provide this parking for these units to um, you know, attract residents, or, or if this is just a condition of your site, you're able to fit those spaces, and so you, you are going to. Well, it's uh, a function of both, I believe. Um, I do believe that some um, tenants will have uh, cars um, that maybe they'll utilize just on weekends, um, since it is such a transit-rich neighborhood. Um, but then it's also the function of we're going to excavate a cellar um, and we can accommodate the parking and it may be uh, an attraction to market the building. Um, but the spaces will be open to, to all, all residents um, and if there is excess space available, um, it was actually raised at the community board as to whether those spaces would be available to residents on Bergen Street. Um, and so if that is in fact the case, we would we would look to accommodate them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner De La Rose. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm wondering if you could just uh, go through the mix of units. I, for some reason, that, that's the one thing I can't find. Yeah, so the building, um, so the, the applicant is the developer and holder of long-term assets. They're looking for more stable tenants. Um, so in that regard, they are um, proposing all one and two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. There are currently um, 14 uh, uh, one bedrooms and 12 two bedrooms. Um, and uh, the way that will work out in terms of the affordable units is um, we'll have 50% of the affordable units will be two bedrooms and 50% will be one bedrooms. Okay, so five and five. Yes. Thank you. Other questions or comments for Mr. Reinsmith? Thank you. Thank you. 
Now, Mr. Reinsmith is the only speaker who signed up on this matter. If there are others present who would like to be heard, please raise your hand. Then the public hearing on this matter is closed. Madam Secretary, any other business? No, Madam Chair. Then I will wish good morning. <laughs> <laughs>